Like the eve, August Falcha. Hi and hello. I'm John O'Sullivan of the Irish Pagan School, but I also write under the name on Scaly Bug, which is the little storyteller. And um, that's the Irish word Scaly being a storyteller and Bug being the word for small. And um, the reason why I go by little storyteller as opposed to just a regular storyteller is because I write about the, the patron god that I work for, who is known as Ondagda Moore, which is the big Dagda. And so he's the big Dagda and I'm his little storyteller. But the story I have for you today is about how I met the Morrigan. And oddly enough, you might be surprised to find out, I met the Morrigan before I even knew of or acknowledged the existence of the Dagda's influence in my life. So this story kind of has a bit of a, an important meaning for anyone who kind of has a spiritual practice in many ways. And it's something that's been very fundamental for me and foundational for my approach to spirituality. And this is why I wanted to share that tale with you today. So long and short of it is, we go back to 2013 and John, John was a different John back then. John was kind of recovering from an abusive relationship, was trying to reestablish himself with his identity, was trying to um, come back from losing his job. He was back living with his parents. You know, all of the kind of stuff that you think or would equate to a failure as an adult um, seemed to have come around for John in that time. Um, it wasn't a failure, though, and I can say that now. If at any point you need to take a step back, if you need to kind of return to family homes, or even if it's, you know, family of choice as opposed to blood family, it's not a failure. It's just a, an adjustment or a change in the direction of your life. The reason why I want to say that is we do get a, like, communication from many people who are finding their growth and their change in their spiritual path and it leads to some of those kind of not a setback it's like a tactical withdrawal you know you go back to where you're strongest you go back to where your foundations are your roots and there you can grow again you grow from there again and so I was going through this period myself in 2013 and I was beginning to kind of collect myself more and realize that my spirituality had shifted it had changed um now i had studied angel card reading i had uh, i was a very kind of active christian at the time i i long ago gave up the the identifier as catholic but that's a different story for another day um but i had i'd been still referring to myself as christian and but there was elements of my spirituality that had shifted and changed and i was still trying to figure that out and it was there that I found out the, the Dublin Pagan pub moot. And I was like, you know what? My sister goes to those. I haven't seen her in a while. I'm going to go in. So um, on one particular day, I kind of just decided, took it in my head, took a notion to go in. And I arrived in the Longstone in Dublin. And I just slipped in and sat down with these groups of pagans and um, and there was a presentation going on. They brought in a speaker to kind of talk about the Morrigan. And that speaker was Laura O'Brien. And so I'm sitting in the back, you know, just trying to not make much of a deal of myself and just kind of be around and share space with people. And, um, you know, Laura finishes their presentation and then she sits down and, you know, um, I, I was sitting with my sister at this time. Who knows Laura? Their, their friendship predates my relationship with Laura. And... Laura kind of eyeballs me across the table. And this is in May of that year, 2013. And she eyeballs me across the table and says the words, you owe me time. Now, I was new to figuring stuff out, but it was kind of aware that, you know, having just heard Laura's presentation, talking about the Morrigan, talking about this goddess of poetry, battle, prophecy, this goddess of sovereignty and change, you know, I, I was very comfortable with the sound of Laura's voice. This, though similar, was slightly different. And that was my first kind of interaction, I would say, with hearing the Morrigan. But this isn't how, that's how I, I, I later met the Morrigan. But um, so I was placed in this position in May and I was like, yeah, because I was aware that the shifting and the changing my spiritual growth was some form of calling there was some some kind of calling there's an old irish term called a come hither where you have this compulsion the spiritual kind of compulsion placed upon you and um i began to realize at that point that you know 
uh, there was some come hither placed upon me. And I was like, yeah, it's grand. We'll deal with it before the end of the year. In my mind, thinking it's a long way from May to December. So things carry on. John's carrying on living his life, trying to figure himself out. Um, and then the come hither gets very strong at the start of August. And I'm like, personally kind of trying to figure myself out. And I was like, yeah, but it's not the end of the year. And this was the second time I had the impression and the connection to the Morrigan because her response was, your year ends in August because I'm born in August. And it was that kind of lovely twist of dynamic, really. I couldn't disagree with it. I couldn't argue with it because, you know, I was born in August. And so, you know, technically my annual solar return occurs in August. So that's how I found myself in desperate need of spiritual guidance um, and like literal landscape guidance because she didn't want to meet me where I was. She wanted to meet me where she is. And so on the 15th of August in that year, I had arranged to meet up with a tour guide who kind of did spiritual tours of the Rathcorhan area, specifically the Cave of Cats, Uvnagach. Um, now, we know from the Irish lore that Uvnagach is this access to the other world. Um, now, it's not underworld, it's other world. It's a very specific thing in the Irish tradition. It's this other life. It's referred to on Sail Ella. This literally the words Sail Ella is other life. And so this passageway into the darkness is an entrance to the other world, but it's also connected to the Morrigan. It's referred to as her fit abode. And so I'm, I get this come hither, as I said, placed upon me. And it's like, I, I got to go into the cave of the cats. I got to go to Uvnagach. And I contacted the only person who at that point in my life, I had figured out as someone who could match me on my worst day. Like, if this is going to be my worst day, um, like, I'm, I'm aware of my own energetic impact. I'm, I try and be careful about it. But, you know, there was only one person I knew who could actually match me, like, step for step. And that was Laura. So I contacted Laura. And this is pre-relationship. This is um, where we don't know each other. I've, I've worked at her pagan conference or pagan festival fail a drake for a number of years but i was the anomaly who would turn up for a weekend do a whole lot of effort and energy work and then just disappear off into the dark again and um, turns out from conversations later i made me some form of enigma in laura's mind and that's a different story for a different day um so that's how i find myself driving across Ireland from Dublin to Roscommon. So it's a two hour, three hour drive, changing my location on the landscape, meeting up with Laura. And we had lunch and we went for a talk and she took me around the tour guiding spots. And um, I began to explain to her, like, you know, this open up about the anomaly this that was John in that, like, I am a spiritual person. I have a lot of kind of like spiritual drive in my own existence. I feel it's a very important fundamental part of being a human in our world like you know we're physical beings we're intellectual beings we're emotional beings but we're also spiritual beings and so we're going through this and Laura's kind of tour guiding and teaching me kind of stuff and we're standing before the mound of Rathcrohan this is like the the Rath May like Rathcrohan is the seat of May Queen Maeve's power in Connacht and um, as Laura's kind of going through the tour guide information she mentions a family name who was very prominent in that area. And I, I just broke myself and laughed because the family name was the O'Connors. And so at that point, like if, if you if you live a spiritual existence, there are some points where the, the universe kind of hits a beat and you feel it. You know, there's some kind of synchronicity. There's an awareness where, you know, something is said in passing but it resonates and just lands very heavily and saying the name o'connor's in that area was one of those moments for me because i have o'connor bloodline so through my matriarchal line on my dad's side the mazzy is what we called her and um, she was a connor who married an o'connor so we we doubled down on the o'connor influences so i may be an o'sullivan but you know go back what his his granny yeah, his, his granny was uh, Granny Connor, the Mazzy. Um, and so 
it was this kind of the awareness and that was the next time when I felt the Morgan and this is when she laughed at me it was this moment of like <laughs> gotcha <laughs> because bloodline and so the ancestral connection between my life and my my ancestry and the location so again I just want to be very clear here for a second it's not about DNA all right it, like the blood that flows in my body doesn't entitle me to a form of spirituality or doesn't kind of entitle me to any form of connection prestige or anything like that at all it is literally just blood but the thing is it's the ancestry and the connection and the stories that connected to the landscape that's where the resonance comes in so even if you don't have O'Connor bloodline in it you can still be called you can still have a connection to spirituality even if you're not in Ireland you can still be called to have a connection to spirituality so I want to be very firm on that there are many people or many organizations out there who kind of put too much too much relevance on DNA and blood as opposed to like ancestry connection and right relationship between a person and the deity or a person in the landscape or the deities in the landscape. So hopefully I've made that pretty clear. So I have this O'Connor ancestor in me. And it was that moment I got this impression, this like vision in my head. Now I'm not talking about large kind of esoteric kind of astral experiences or anything like that. That's, that's not my forte, I'll be honest with you. But I'm a very imaginative person and I'm, I write stories. I've been reading stories since I was a kid. This is why I wear glasses, because the doctor was like, hey, you don't even need to wear your glasses when you're watching TV or reading books. And I was like, I just read books all the time, so I may as well not take my glasses off. <laughs> so I then get this impression, this, this as, as the Morgan laughs at me for my realization, I get this impression of this long piece of kind of parchment or vellum with this kind of agreement and writing on it at the bottom of which is a bloody fingerprint from one of my O'Connor ancestors and so that's that's pretty much that third time when I heard the Morrigan and it, it was like yeah well you, know, you have enough O'Connor blood in you to make the come hither work so I, I laugh <laughs> she's laughing I may as well fucking laugh and so that's where Again, Laura looked at me a bit odd because I just laughed out of nowhere and it took me a moment to kind of gather myself back and explain, I have O'Connor blood in me. <laughs> um, and that's when she had the realization of like, oh, well, shit, this is not just a regular Turgani experience. There's actually something else going on here. Um, so we moved around the space. We went across like the different areas of the complex. And then, of course, we went to the cave. Now, the cave of the Cats of Nagach is um archaeologically speaking like it, there's a man-made suit rain that leads down into uh an open area that leads down into an enclosed cavern below um that we have we, we can still access at the moment now it is on private land okay so i will always again go back to that and say listen you need to be able to go to these places with respect and need to go to these places with a a, a listed registered tour guide because the private landowners you know, have an agreement with the tour guides for access, but not for random people to walk up. And so Laura is a, a recognized tour guide in the area, so I was okay to go. And so we go down into the cave. Laura explains all the health and safety notices, and like, you know, she's the first one in and the last one out. And so we, we go down into the cave, and it is a tight fit. I am a broad guy, and there are parts where I literally have to squish my body sideways and scooch down in this dark passage. And we went in without any light. You know, Laura's like, you can use a light if you want. And it's like, no, I need to go in in the dark. You know, I need to forego my sight. I need to experience this in, in a very particular way. And so I switch myself down and scrape myself on boulders and get mucky and wet. And, you know, it's it's not the most pleasant. It's not like, a oh, I'll just jaunt on down into the cave of the cats. It's, it's an experience. Some would say it's an ordeal. And so I go down into this space and... Laura is ahead of me calling back the instructions and she kind of gets to the opening and she said, listen, the space opens up from here. You know, you're down at the last step and from here it opens into the cavern inside. And she says, I'm going to go across the cavern. There's a spot I sit up on the side. That's where I'll be. And if you move into the space, find a space you're comfortable with and we're going to stay here, you know, on, on, as long as we need to stay here. I don't move in. I'm standing on this step. And I can feel in the darkness this open space in front of me because I can feel the shift in 
kind of like the close proximity of the stone around me but then there's this wall of black on the front and i can see nothing there is just complete darkness and i wait standing on this threshold step beneath the earth in the cave of the cats but i don't have to wait long so i'm aware of this kind of empty space in front of me i can feel i can smell like the the kind of the cavern area, the damp inside, you know, the silence, the heavy silence, you know, all I'm aware is my own heart beating and my own kind of like breath moving. I don't even know where Laura is anymore. But then I begin to feel, again, I didn't hear anything, I didn't see anything, but I began to feel another pre presence and it was a predatory presence. Um, I, uh, there are no large predators in Ireland. Like there's no kind of, large predatory creatures we don't have wolves we don't have bears um like so i i have never in my life been hunted by a predatory creature so i don't know if my experience is something i can equate but that my my experience with the morrigan is what i would equate to being hunted by a predatory creature is it's this instinctual chill up your spine it's this moment of like, you know, your, the hairs on the back of your neck ripple, like your, your, your skin goes to goose flesh and like, you know, you know, something is there, something is nearby. And now I'm standing on this threshold, literally wedged by these rocks, you know, and I know that it's a very tight passage going back up behind me. But for some reason, this energy is circling me. It's moving around me and snuffling at me. It's this kind of curious predatory kind of thing circling prey <laughs> um and so then out of the darkness i hear the morrigan and she speaks to me and she says ask ask for what you want and so knowing that I had this come hither placed on me, knowing my experience, knowing why I was like that I had to turn up, I turned up. But in this moment, I realized she was offering me a job. So the Morgan had called me over and she was like, you know, you ask for what you want. We'll come to an agreement and you'll work for me. Now, <laughs> at that point in my life, as I said, I was not in my best fullest extent of me um you know i had the high paying job i had the house the car the the marriage all of that kind of stuff and all of that fell apart and went away i was back at home i didn't have a job i was kind of trying to figure myself out and here was a goddess offering me solutions for in exchange for work but some part of me said no nah. Because I actually, I, in that darkness with her, like, you know, offering me this position, I, I said, there's nothing I want that I can't get myself. So thanks, but no thanks. And that's when the energy of the Morgan shifted slightly for me. It was this almost, like, it, what, what had been this imagined contract where, like, I would agree to services and this stuff. The contract was kind of then written in crayon. And she kind of explained it again as if I was a bit dense. It was like, no, 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 you don't understand. You tell me what you want and I will make sure that happens. And then you work for me. And then she said, say the words. It was almost like trying to school me as a toddler into how to make an agreement. <laughs> but my brain, um, I knew what I was looking at here. I knew kind of the calling that was placed upon me and the potential and to this day, I still don't know how I survived my next words facing the Morrigan, but I just said, words are just wind. And she was gone. There was this kind of like shudder of like, what? And she was gone. Now, then from out of the darkness, I heard Laura kind of cough and she was like, um, I don't know what happened just there. But I think I think your time here is done. And I was like, yeah, I know. <laughs> um, now, when Laura guides people into an experience, Laura doesn't 
curate a spiritual experience, doesn't kind of guarantee a spiritual experience. Um, she's just a tour guide to make people go in and go out and to make sure that they're safe. Um, she has, if people have spiritual experiences or if the Morrigan steps in to use her voice in any way, um, she doesn't have memory of that. She doesn't get to re recall that. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I'm in the Morrigan's cave. I'm down there in the cave of the cats. I meet the Morrigan face to face. She offers me a job and I'm like, thanks, but no thanks. And so then I turned around and left. So I climbed my way back up out of the darkness, scraping and scratching myself on the rocks and returned back into our world, the world above, the world of sunlight and wind and breezes. And when I kind of made it back outside, I had to kind of think back over the experience again. Of course, you know, I've returned to this life in a way and I'm considering back over and then it's going through the processes in my head of like okay did I just experience that did I just imagine that was it just my own kind of flight of fancy or was there some other shift or change that happened and I became very aware that there was some other shift or change because the computer was gone and there was also this kind of like who do you think you were <laughs> And so I turned back towards the cave and looking down into her cave, into her darkness, I said, you have my love and you have my respect, but you don't have my service. So from there, you know, I carried on with my growth and with my life. Um, I then moved and, you know, Laura and I got to figure each other out and become more connected as friends, which then eventually led to a relationship. And, you know, it was a good year or so later before the name of the Dagda was dropped for me. You know, in fact, it was Laura. <laughs> in fact, the Dagda bothered Laura, a Morrigan priest, into saying his name out loud nearby so that I would actually hear it and have the connection and realization that I needed. I was aware of his influence. I was aware of this presence hanging around me. I wasn't sure who it was, um, but that's why it needed the naming. And the naming of the thing gave me perspective. And that started my journey to become the Dyke the Bard. But I met the Morrigan. I met the Morrigan first. I went down into the cave of the cats and I came back out. And that is the first and the last time I have been in that cave. I've been back many times. You know, I have the privilege and the honor of like, tour guiding around Ireland and Laura and myself going to the Rathcon complex and bringing people to and from that cave. But I don't go in. I have no need to go in. And so I have this odd relationship with the Morrigan. I love her. I respect her. Many of the stories I write include her. But I don't work for her. She doesn't have my service. And the reason why I wanted to share this particular story is because the Morrigan is a goddess of sovereignty. But we're not just talking about sovereignty from a landscape point of view, sovereignty from ruling and ownership. We're also talking about the idea and the concept of personal sovereignty. We have the right to be sovereigns of our own existence. We have the right to establish our own boundaries and to have other people respect those boundaries. We have the right to declare who and how we are in our existence and to move forward from that with people honoring and respecting those boundaries. That is personal sovereignty. That is an action of personal sovereignty. And it doesn't just extend to people. It also extends to deities. And so we have a lot of people come to us at the school because they have a Morrigan experience or they have a Dagda experience or they have a connection with some other God and they're not kind of sure what to do. And, you know, they have to kind of figure it out. And this is all important. It's very important. You know, take the learning, do the teaching, do the reading. But the other thing to, to realize is you always have a choice. Each of us are born with free will. We have the option, we have a will, we have a choice. And so for me, even with my connection and my relationship with the Dagda, he offered me work. And I said, no, thanks. He's like, well, you know, I'm going to hang around and we'll figure each other out. And, you know, and that was my connections with him. I was like, no, I'm not interested. He's like, yeah, but we could do all this kind of stuff. And I was like, I'm not interested. 
because yeah, I am very stubborn. <laughs> I am very willful as an individual. But it went, got to the point in my life where I needed something. I had a need. I had a need that was bigger than myself. I had a need. I didn't need to protect someone's life to save someone. And it was someone that I couldn't reach myself. It was someone that I could not influence or connect with myself. And I was like, okay, if you want to do this, this is my price. That person is taken care of. That person is kept alive. That person's mental health is looked after. That person is cared for. And you, you take her, that person, you take that person under your arm and you look after them. If you do that, I'll be your bird. And he was like, yeah, fair job's done. And I'm very grateful because he has 100% turned up for that person and he has been there and that person may not even realize it may not even recognize the influence of the dag in their life um but i'm very grateful that he does look after them and so my agreement with him is that i say the dagda's name every day i am his bard i tell his stories and so over the years my relationship with him has improved and has changed and you know when he needed more from me i was like okay you're looking more for me than i need more from you our agreement needs to change. There's these other people that I need you looking after. There's these other people that you need to take care of for me. You do that and I'll be more than your bird. I will teach about you. And if needs be, I'll priest for you. If people need a dag the priest, not just attack the bird, I'll do that work too. Although, you know, I, Irish using the word priest, different story. I'll tell you about that again some other time. But the whole process of this is that we always have a choice. And so for me, connecting to that relationship, building that kind of agreement with the Dagda means that it is a matter of choice. I choose to work for him. I, I, I love and respect the Morgan, but I choose not to work for her. And because I made that choice, I am both empowered, but also responsible. I'll never turn around and say I was made to, or I had to. You know, the Dagda never makes me do anything. The Morrigan couldn't make me do something, <laughs> you know? Okay, I love her. Again, I'm not speaking out of turn, but I don't have an agreement with her. I love her. I really do. I respect her, but I don't work for her. And this is where there's that idea of responsibility and empowerment. But what another word that you can use on that is consent. I consent to work for the Dagda. And because of that consensual relationship, we work well together. I don't consent to work for the Morrigan. But I love her and I respect her. And so... This concept of consent is so linked with personal sovereignty and for me so linked with the Morrigan that I feel we have a good balanced relationship. She's not going to force people into stuff, but she'll encourage them. She'll, she'll get right up in your, in your grill if you have a relationship with her and she'll be like, this is how it has to happen. This is how it needs to go. And in many cases, she writes, she's a goddess of prophecy. She can see outside of our view of linear time, and she sees the potential of what will happen. She might be kind of speaking more to, to future you than she is speaking to current you, but at the end of the day, unless you have an agreement, unless you kind of have some re respectful relationship, you still can consent to, to agree or consent not to. Now, doesn't mean that you're absent of consequence or absence of responsibilities. You know, if I don't consent to wear my seatbelt and I crash and go flying through my windscreen, then there you go. Consequences to fit the action. If I don't consent to take vaccinations and I end up, you know, infecting not just me and my loved ones, then there's consequences that always happen. Now, again, for me personally, I take my vaccinations, sign me up, give me the boosters, it's not just about me. It's about my people. It's about my tour, my tribe, about everyone else around me who needs to be cared for as well and who may not be as resilient as I am. But 
another talk for another day. Um, but this idea of consent is so linked with sovereignty. And if the Morrigan is a goddess of sovereignty, then she's a goddess of consent. She may be a goddess of change. She may be a goddess of power and prophecy and battle and poetry and everything else. But at the very basis of it, you know, we're looking at consent, we're looking at respect, and we're looking at what we in the Irish pagan school talk of as right relationship, core quiveness. And so turning up to the Morrigan's cave, being called, being summoned, being brought by ancestor bloodline, going down into that darkness and ha- meeting the Morrigan was a joy. It was an experience that shifted my life in so many amazing ways. It has changed me in so many ways. But that doesn't mean I'm bound to her. That doesn't mean I am obligated to her. And so my relationship with the Morrigan is a little bit irreverent. I love her. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the cheeky kid. I'm the one who walks past the Morrigan altar behind me right there, shoots at finger guns and is like... That's my relationship with her. The Dagda's altar is right below that, by the way. You know, So if I'm being cheeky to her, I know he's laughing at it as well. But I only know that because I've built up my relationship over time. I've built up my relationship by reading their ancient stories, by exploring the lore, by taking the classes in the Irish pagan school, by teaching the classes in the Irish pagan school. And so hopefully this has given you some insight into how I met the Morrigan, and how it influences my life even now. So I'm going to finish off because I realize I've been talking for quite a while with this, but hopefully it's been entertaining. Hopefully something in this story has resonated with you, has given you a bit of an insight, given you a bit of perspective, because that's what's important here. It's about understanding that we, each of us are on our own spiritual journey and that as we go forward, it's only true empowering ourselves more taking responsibility more you know consenting as we do setting our boundaries and expecting those boundaries to be to be met and i always say this if someone doesn't respect your boundaries they're showing they don't respect you fundamentally if someone's like oh, i'll just push your boundaries all the time they're not just pushing a boundary they're showing disrespect to you and so it's important to have that connection to your personal sovereignty have that connection to yourself and put the work in for yourself And so that is a a part of what we do, a small, small part of what we do at the Irish Pagan School. We create these teachings, we create this information so that people can empower themselves by taking the classes, can empower themselves by connecting with other community, with our TUA in the Live at Five sessions, with, you know, the online social media groups. Now, all of this is to make sure that we are helping people be their better selves. You know, or even figure out if they are currently being their best self and how they can just be more comfortable in that. And so this is the story about how I met the Morrigan. I hope it was entertaining. I hope it was interesting. And I really hope there was something that at the very least made you smile. So if you can do something for me to round this off, drop me a comment under the YouTube because, you know, I love hearing your perspective i love hearing and finding out what you think of things you know what do you think about personal sovereignty what do you think about the morrigan and like her connection with that idea of consent um and if you can hit the like and subscribe buttons hit the bell for the notifications it really helps connect more of this content with the people who need to experience it out there in the world you know you may have come across this but if you don't kind of give it that bump in your own way, put your own energetic intent behind it, then someone else may never see it. And so from all of us here, and by all of us, I mean me, because it's early on a, early on a morning and I'm sitting here doing the recording for you. Um, I will say thank you very much. I will say, Gaurav Mahagas, Agus Aslan. Goodbye.